It's Thursday, April 16th. We are studying 2 Peter chapter 1. We've gotten to verse 16. Remember the context here. He's made a big deal out of the fact that he is, while he's still there on earth in his body, he's going to work hard to steer them up, stir them up by way of reminder. This is stuff they already knew. He knows his death is coming soon, and he reprises this strong verb here to make every effort so that after uh, his departure, after he dies, they'll be able to recall uh, all of these things. At any time, they'll have it. And so he's writing it. He's seeing this as his task. He's going to make every effort uh, to utilize his gifts and the things that God has given him, the role that he's given him to do the work of letting them know all this. And then we start our passage here. For we did not cleverly, we did not follow, rather, cleverly devised myths. This was not a myth. When we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but instead, not that this was a myth, but instead we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And again, as I told you last time, I want to just show you the very simple syntactical out, outline here, diagram. It's not going to make a huge difference in every case, but I like to, to see it visually this way. Uh, let's, we're going to look at a couple of things here, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, about them making it known. And I want to start just by making a big deal out of this, the four. Um, think back to the point of this whole section of them making every effort to add to their faith. And then him reprising that verb and saying, I'm going to make every effort to tell you these things. Why all the work? Why all the stress? Why all the imperative? Why all the, you know, be, being diligent in this matter? Well, he's about to tell us, for this is not, it's not a myth. This is important that we realize this has a this is a truth and it has consequences. It it's weighty, it's important. And he's saying we're not doing all this for nothing. We're not doing all this because it's just an idea or a concept. He says when and we should make a point out of this as well. When we made known to you, when we made known to you that when we were eyewitnesses, we didn't follow this, we made known to you, we were witnesses of his majesty. Now, who's the we in this passage? Uh, of course, he's not talking to the recipients of the letter. Uh, they weren't the eyewitnesses of the majesty of God and the power and coming of Christ. Uh, and they weren't making it known to themselves. Uh, we here, even though it's a letter that is addressed uh, singularly, I should say, it's uh, the authorship is, is noted as a singular author, Peter, Peter the Apostle. Um, he's now using a first-person plural pronoun to remind us that this is the apostolic band, the, uh, the prophetic followers of Christ. They're going to be the ones who make this known. Of course, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people, I'm sure, heard Christ preach, but here were his authorized sent ones. Apostle, as you might remember from the beginning of this book, is uh, one who is sent as an authorized delegate to speak with the authority of Christ. And so the we now in this passage reminds us that Peter is part of a band. This isn't uh, a religion started by one person, even though Peter was such a monumental and important leader in the first century church in Jerusalem, uh, and he was always listed first among the apostles, the plural here reminds us that he's part of the apostolic band, that he is speaking uh, as a part of a group of people that were called and gifted to bring this message to um, the church and the first generation of the church here. And, and of course, the emphasis on this passage is what at least in the first phrase here, what it's not. We didn't follow cleverly devised myths. It's not myths. No, as a matter of fact, we were eyewitnesses of it. He's trying to make the distinction that this is not just a story. A lot of people think of Christianity that way. And as Francis Schaeffer, a generation ago, made very clear uh, in a day when everyone liked to take the truth claims of Christianity and put them in a category of what they called religious truth. Uh, Francis Schaeffer was uh, known for popularizing, among many things that he popularized, the phrase true truth, trying to let people know that we're not talking here about uh, preferences. Just because it's a religious truth claim doesn't mean it's not a claim, at least in Christianity, of something that is factual. Uh, truth, by definition, is a a statement of a correspondence to something real, a correspondence to reality. This correspondence theory of truth means that we believe and say something to be true that we believe and assert has a correspondence to reality. Now, there are lots of things that we talk about in terms of what we might state that are opinion or preference. And that's what uh, here 
Uh, Peter is trying to distinguish that Christianity is not a statement of some kind of story. It's not a presentation of some kind of idea. It's not a concept. It's not a principle. Uh, Biblical Christianity, though it has principles and instruction in it, it's based on something truth. It's based on the person of Christ, who was a real figure in time, in history. And of course, God, the God who is, is described by Christ and revealed in Christ and actually was the incarnation of that God. So the distinction of opinionated truth and um, the, the, the preferences of what you might want to affirm is what you like and what you believe and what I believe. Now, these are things that we need to dismiss and dispel from the conversations we might have about the truthfulness of Christianity. You can't just say it's true for you, but not for me. I mean, this is like mathematics. This is like historical assertions. Was there an Abraham Lincoln? What did he say at Gettysburg? I mean, what, whatever your assertion is, when we're talking about historical truth, biblical truth, uh, you can't just say, well, that's good for you. It's true for you. It's not true for me. Uh, Either it's true or it isn't true. And that is a great passage to remind us of that, that Peter's trying to make the distinction there. So it's not religious truth versus real truth. It's not preference versus fact. Uh, Christianity is not just about a story to live by or a fable to live by. It corresponds with reality. And one of the great passages that couldn't make that more clear is the historical claims of the resurrection of Christ. Look at this passage with me from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it says, if Christ has not been raised. Talking about real space and time realities. Then our preaching, all the stuff that we're talking about, like Peter talking about things that he's talking about in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, it would all be stupid. It would be ridiculous. It would all be in vain. And your faith, whatever you're trusting in, would be in vain. It'd be all for nothing. He says, and we are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he, here's some actual facts here, raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised, which is a bigger category and subject that Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But it's the same idea here. We can't say there was a person named Jesus and he uh, did ministry in Galilee, he was born in Bethlehem, and he died in Jerusalem. If these things did not happen, well, then he says, we're found to be misrepresenting God. Uh, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. It's all in vain. It's for nothing. And there's no real uh, uh, expiation. There's no uh, atonement for your sins. Uh, And not only are they liars, but it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. Uh, it's It's not useful for anything. Verse 18, then those who also, uh, who have fallen asleep, a euphemism for death in Christ, trusting in Christ, well, then they've perished. There's no truth beyond it, right? There's no reality to it. If in Christ we've hoped in this life only, in other words, that's a good way to think about the idea of if it's just a story to live by, then we are all people most to be pitied. You ought to pity Christians, and there are several in a liberal camp of of, of liberal Christianity, and I say that not in terms of politics, but in terms of theology, they've departed from the historical truth claims of the Bible. And the Bible says uh, about those folks is that you ought to pity them. If Christianity is simply just a story to live by, to get you through this life, to keep you on a path that is better than being on that path, if it's about the here and now, as I often say, well, then it really, I mean, there's lots of other things you could do to kind of make your life more palatable or peaceful or whatever. Um, Christianity is a claim about truth, real truth. It corresponds to reality. And he's saying, in our passage that this is what um, Christianity is claiming. And Peter says this is not a a myth. Anyway, back to our passage here. Uh, We made it known to you. And again, I want to talk about the we here. We made it known to you. Well, who made it known? Uh, Well, the apostles made it known. The apostles made it known, and the apostles were telling us things. And it's an interesting word here. It's not the word uh, revealed. It's a word to... um, a similar word, the idea of making something known, a, a, a set of, of, of facts that are true, but they're being declared to you, they're being uh, revealed to you in the sense that you are getting the information that you didn't know, but it's someone who's trying to relate to you truth that actually took place. Uh, and all the truth of what it means. Christ dies on a cross, that's a historical truth. The theology is, here's what God said is the transaction that takes place on the cross. And he says, we impart Paul here speaking. And again, the we, I would argue in this passage, is just like Peter's we. We're not talking just about Paul, and we're not talking about Paul and the Corinthians, just like Peter's not talking about his recipients here. 
He says, we, the apostolic prophetic band, uh, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom from God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, for our good, for our glorification. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then he quotes this Old Testament text. He says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And we often quote that thing about, well, it'll be really great when we get to the new Jerusalem and how good it'll be. We can't even imagine how good it'll be. Well, that's not what this passage is really talking about here in verse number 10. These things God has revealed to us, the apostolic band, through the Spirit. The Spirit moved them along, as we're going to see in 2 Peter. Now, the Spirit uh, moves them along to reveal this to us. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. All the secret wisdom and hidden wisdom from God, that's the things that the Spirit knows, and He has imparted it through the apostles and the prophets to us. The church. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received, talking again, the we here I think goes back here to this we, which is the apostolic prophetic band of, of, of followers of Christ who now have been commissioned, given the authentication of miraculous signs, and they have received not the spirit of the world, they're not just trying to figure God out, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And then the us here is not just the apostolic man, but the entire church. Of course, the apostles have been given this information for the good of the church, which is another text I'd like to show you here from Ephesians chapter 2. The myths are not what Peter's message is based on. It's based on facts. He's about to talk about that in terms of being an eyewitness. But all of that apostolic man is for the good of the church. And it says this, no longer than are you strangers or aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation. How did we get here? Well, the message, the message that came through the apostles and the prophets. And of course, it's all about Christ Jesus, who himself is the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, now here's us, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The Spirit is drawing you in, putting you in this thing, but it's all based on this reality that is given to us and relayed to us through the apostles and the prophets, which might remind us, by the way, that if that's the foundation, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that is what we're built on, the information that's coming from them into this written word that we have, the codification, the inscripturation of, of this uh, divinely revealed information, that that that's a foundation. We don't, we don't have that repeated. We don't have ongoing revelation. We have the truth once for all delivered to the saints. This last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, really makes that point clear in the end of the book that this is the finality of God's revelation to us in this time, in this dispensation, if you will. And it's important for us to know that and that we understand that, that the foundation of the apostles and prophets are where we get this information. And it comes to them uh, through uh, Christ and through God's Spirit. And he lets us know, and, and, and along with the other apostles in the New Testament that write the New Testament, of a couple of things here. The power and the coming of our Lord Jesus in the text. It says the power, of course, the miraculous signs of Christ were uh, in time and space. They were performed, and then they were related to us through the pen or the quills, the, 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 the writings of the apostles. Um, and it says in John 10, look at this text, John 10, 25 through 27, uh, that these were all there to bear witness about Christ. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. You do not believe because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And those signs were there to bear witness about the truthfulness of Christ. And Peter is relaying those. He's relaying those in particular about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the text and the context here is probably referring to the first coming. But by the time we get to chapter 3, he uses that same word, pereousia, in Greek, the coming of the Lord. He uses that also for the second coming of the Lord, which is usually how that word is used in the New Testament, uh, with maybe the exception of this right here. It's used in some non-Christological 
liturgical context that have nothing to do with Christ. But when it speaks of Christ, we're usually thinking of the appearing of Christ in the second coming. But Peter here is talking about him coming the first time in power. He, he was, I know that because we're dealing with him being an eyewitness of his majesty. He saw Christ. He saw his miracles. He's related that to the church. The church is built on that testimony. It was verified through them being able, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, to be able to authenticate that by the miraculous signs that they did. They made it known, the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we, not a myth, instead were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Uh, just like the trilemma that C.S. Lewis brings us about Christ, he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord, you can apply to the scriptures as it's presented to us. The scriptures are presented to us as something as though these people saw it, they were eyewitnesses to it, and they recorded it. If that's not true, right, then you're going to say, well, then they're deceivers, they're liars, and the book should be dismissed as deception, or they're crazy. They think they saw things that they didn't see. They claim to be eyewitnesses, but they imagined it all. They hallucinated it all. Well, then they're crazy. Uh, and we should dismiss the book as a crazy book, a book of people's musings about things that didn't happen. Or just like the trilemma of C.S. Lewis uh, about Christ, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Same thing about the scripture. We look at those three options. It's either deceptive or it's hallucinating realities that or non-realities that they think are real, and we should dismiss it in those two categories, or it is God's revealed truth. It is the historic truth that has the historic meanings that are given to us through the pen of the apostles. So much more I wanted to say about that, and really maybe I can just leave you with this one passage here. I'll read this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. If this is true, if this is the truth, well, then we ought to thank God whenever we see us or anyone else receive that word of God which is heard from us, preached in the first century and recorded for us throughout and available to all successive generations, that we accept it, great word decomai, that we embrace it, we welcome it, not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God. And when it is the word of God, it's at work in us who trust in it. So uh, more we can say, but let's move on tomorrow to verse 17. Uh, it's an uh, ongoing study. We want you to subscribe to it, comment on it, and we'll be back tomorrow to continue our study of 2 Peter chapter 1.